Hello, everybody. Um, that's my Twitter handle in case you want to tweet. That's my Korean first name, so don't be alarmed. I know it's a little bit different. So what are we going to talk about today? Found these Lego minifigs, thought they were awesome. Basically how you know I went from wanting to be in a hazmat suit, studying diseases, to being a person sitting at a computer. Like, how does that work? How does that happen? So how many people in the room have heard of the term epidemiology? It's actually well, several. Awesome. So since most people now, I'll just kind of breeze through this. You know, it's um, derived from three Greek terms, epi, demi, and logos. And literally, it means to study a, what is upon the people. So you know, what do epidemiologists look at? They look at the frequency, the distribution of different risk factors, causes of health-related outcomes, could be disease, infection. And they look in different populations. So it could, could be community-based, it could be school-based, it could be on a global scale or a local scale, either type. How many people have heard of Jon Snow? <laughs> no, 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 well, not this one. <laughs> this Jon Snow. I know, if you actually Google him and you haven't ever Googled him before, Google will actually ask, are you looking for this Jon, the, this Jon Snow, not this one. It's hilarious, happened to me a few times. Finally, Google learned what I was needing. <laughs> it was kind of funny. So Jon Snow, he's considered one of the fathers of epidemiology, primarily because the 1854 Broad Street Clara outbreak. So Jon Snow at the time was a big skeptic of a theory that a lot of people believed was true called the miasma theory. And basically it was that disease and infection was spread by toxic air. And actually in the early 19th century, several academics used to believe that obesity was caused by people simply smelling the odor of food. <laughs> Thankfully that's not the case. And luckily that theory doesn't hold true. And the germ theory hadn't been established yet. And so the germ theory basically is that the disease uh, can spread through microorganisms. So what did Jon Snow do? Well, there was this cholera outbreak and he was trying to figure out where did it originate from? So think of this as a prehistoric heat map of your website. And this is where everybody's clicking, right? What's causing them to click there? Well, in this case, the click, everyone's trying to click on the pump. And it was this Broad Street pump for some reason, everybody liked to go to it. They liked the taste of the water, but unbeknownst to them, they were drinking fecal water <laughs> at the time. Researchers found that this pump was only dug about three feet deep, and it was next to a cesspit. So cesspits at the time were people were throwing their waste. Unfortunately, a baby's nappy or diaper had fallen into the cesspit, and this baby had cholera. So essentially, everybody was drinking this fecal-infested water. Jon Snow went to political officials at the time, told them what happened, told them what was going on. They removed the pump handle, the Clara outbreak subsided. However, after it subsided, they put the pump handle back on and they disregarded everything Jon Snow said because nobody really wanted to admit that there's any sort of fecal oral route of transmission of disease. It's not appealing. Most people didn't want to talk about it at the time. We talk about everything these days on social media, on the news, but back then, nobody wanted to talk about it. It was considered taboo. But you know, he didn't give up. And so essentially in the field of any sort of research, you may find things that are unpopular to the general public. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't stop searching into it, trying to get people to hear your message, because just because it's unpopular, it could save lives. In this case, it did. So where do epidemiologists work? Places like the World Health Organization, CDC, NIH, Homeland Security, kind of neat, Department of Health and Human Services, and now, Big Wing Interactive. <laughs> kind of a different transition that happens there. And so what caused that to happen? I'll give you just a, I'm gonna take you on a journey. It's a short journey, don't worry. Won't take too long. So anybody hear of this movie? A few in the room. This is actually my favorite movie. I loved it, thought it was great. These guys basically were detectives trying to figure out, okay, where did this outbreak occur? What caused it? They found out it was this spider monkey that happened to come over on a boat from Korea. Kind of odd that that was the case. <laughs> I swear, I don't smuggle monkeys. <laughs> Doesn't happen. But you know, I thought this movie was great. At the time, you know, the internet wasn't really available. I had no idea what it was called. I didn't really make the connection at the time that this was epidemiology and that these folks worked at places like the CDC and the NIH. Had no idea. So when I went to college, I actually studied nutritional sciences as my undergrad. 
Allied Health, Public Health at OU happened to be in the same building. So I was exposed to epidemiology, biostatistics, figured out this is exactly what I wanted to do before. I accepted into the program, started studying it, found out about more about statistics and data, and now I'm here. So kind of an interesting journey to take. And also, I just followed my curiosity. I knew there was more data out there. I knew there was more to just collecting clinical-based data. And I wanted to find something new to do. And so when the opportunity arose, I was actually recruited to a different advertising agency here in town. Somebody reached out to me and I was like, you know what? I'm young enough in my career, take a chance. It's something new, it's a challenge, why not? There's so much out there and I, as I made the transition, you know, I was a little bit afraid that maybe I wouldn't understand the terms. No marketing background, hadn't sat in a business class. But then I realized, wow, there's so much parity between the two. It was amazing, like literally, same definitions, just slightly different terms, and it worked. And as Carl Sagan once said, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. So with data, I like to make what is unknown to people known. So let's talk about digital campaigns versus disease and how this works. So if you were to Google the term viral, right? First definition is one I was accustomed to. The other two, though, these are purely related to digital types of content. And what's kind of interesting is that these two are very positive things. This is more of a negative. It's amazing how they are both used in those two spaces. So every day we try to describe our content like a disease is. It's something viral. You want it to infect and spread. And if you look at how the term viral has been used over time, it really spiked at the digital age. It's starting to taper off a little bit, but you know, think about it. Like my daughter's children's children may not even know viral as being associated with the virus at all. They may only know it related to content. It's amazing how that will change. And really what you want to do with your digital campaigns, like I said, is take the same approach that a disease does. You want it to spread, you want it to infect, you want it to be recognizable, you want people to remember it. So if you've ever had food poisoning, right, at a restaurant, if you drive by that restaurant, I guarantee you every single time you're going to remember the time you had food poisoning, the date, the time, what meal it was, what you were wearing, everything. So you want people to do the same thing with your digital campaigns. So if somebody came up to you and asked you at lunch, hungry? What do you think? You know, I think why wait, right? Snickers did that whole campaign about it. I don't always have it lingering, you know, it's not always there, but it's like a trigger. So that's what kind of what you want your digital campaigns to do. You want them to linger and you want them to last. So how can you go about kind of figuring out how you should study your digital campaigns? Well, we're gonna start with some base. Throughout the presentation, I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between what we look at in epidemiology and then translate it for digital. So in the epidemiologic triangle, you typically have a host, an environment, and agent. Host would be like your person and their biological factors. The environment such as like the physical environment or a social environment. And the agent is a factor that has to be present for the disease to manifest, but it's not 100%, like it can't happen 100% just with it. So if you look at a digital triangle, your host becomes your target audience. Your environment becomes your digital presence and your agent becomes something like a call to action. For instance, the conversion cannot happen without the call to action, but you have to have something else that draws people to that call to action, like your digital campaign. You have to drop them on those landing pages with that in order for it to occur. So it's not sufficient enough to just make it happen alone. You have to have other factors drawing people to it. So another way you can look at digital campaigns is if you kind of parody it with the natural history of disease. I won't go through the slide, lots of stuff on it, <laughs> I know. But there's three different levels of prevention that we look at with the disease, right? You have your primary, your secondary, and your tertiary. Think of this as no disease, signs and symptoms, full-blown disease, right? So if you think of this in the case of lung cancer, you see all those health promotion ads that TSET does, right? Tobacco stops with me, everything else. That's your primary prevention level. However, person starts smoking, they start developing lesions on their lungs, that's your secondary level. So you're trying to get them to have some treatment, stop smoking, leave, maybe they'll do it, but they don't. So then they go to this treasury level. They have the disease, they have cancer. So they start having chemotherapy. And then you go to the stage called convalescence, which is basically all the time it takes them to recuperate from 
chemotherapy, time off work, everything else. Hopefully the end phase doesn't become death, but it can happen, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a lot of death in this talk a little bit, so <laughs> I apologize in advance. <laughs> it's kind of what happens with disease. So, if you look at the natural history of digital though, and this doesn't apply globally to every digital campaign, let me say that. This is more of, say you're a new car dealership, right? You have a new car dealership in town, nobody really knows they exist, they have several competitors. This is what you, these are the three different levels instead of prevention and promotion you would do for a customer like that. At this point, you know, you start your content marketing, your SEO, your native advertising, you place pixels to start collecting your audiences so you can use them later in your paid advertising. And at this point, your audience is receptive, but they're undecided. They know about you because they're being impressed by you, but they have no idea if they do or don't like you yet. They're just not sure. So then you start your secondary level of promotion where people are seeing your paid, more of your paid advertisements. They start to be interested in considering you. So this is where people at home would start looking at their budgets, looking to see, does the car fit their family size? Does it work for them? Then they start actively seeking you. They keep seeing your ads more and more, and then they actually start receiving perhaps a mailer from you or emails. So they start looking at your competitors, seeing, oh, wow, their paid advertisements hold true. Their prices are better. They do have better warranties. Then a person converts. They buy your car, they come to the dealership. That's where you're still in maintenance mode. Like you can continue to send them direct mail, email marketing, social posts, and then you want to retain them, but then for them to create referrals for you. So you want them to refer their friends to you so that you know, they don't have to come in at this primary level, they can already drop in at the second. So it's kind of just a constant cycle. So this is kind of a way you can digitally map out what you need to do and the steps you need to take to get people to go from not being a customer to being a customer kind of like the uh, customer life cycle diagrams that you see, very similar to that. Sorry, a little dry. <laughs> so how, what are ways that you can kind of map some of this out to see what, all, what are the causal factors of your outcome? So in epidemiology, we use a web of causation. So this basically says that there's multiple factors interacting with one another causing this disease to happen that are both promoting and inhibiting the disease. So you can have things like your diet, genetic makeup, things like that. This is an example of coronary heart disease. You can easily see that family history and genetic background is the highest causal factor of that disease. Next, you have hypertension, and then smoking is high up there before the high density lipoproteins, but that's your cholesterol. Ethnicity is actually fairly high. Diet and then exercise is last. So it just kind of gives you a single snapshot to see that. So from a digital side, now this is, the, this is the quick example I could pull, pull up, but say you have a allocated budget for your digital campaign. You have all these different services. That's the red line. The blue line is what you actually ended up spending. You had no idea that you were going to have to spend so much time developing new content, modifying the website, call to actions were below the fold, nobody was seeing them, so you had to invest a lot more time on development. So you have to go back to the client and say, look, we had to invest more in this. Let's do a round two. Then you can map your second phase and say, look, we're more in line with what we said we would allocate in the beginning. So it's just a different way you can present these to your clients. And also think of this as a line graph that went like this. So essentially you fold it in on itself. So instead of having to see something laterally, you see it in a single target. So it's just a different way of visualizing your data. In a lot of ways, data visualizations are like ink blots for data. So you know, if you show somebody an ink blot, I may see a bat, some people may see a bird, some people a tree. Visualizations are the same way. You gotta cater it to the audience. So how do you go about like, this, like collecting your data? What's the strategy you should use? Well, in epidemiology, you have different study designs. Two types. First type is observational. And there's two subtypes underneath that. You have your descriptive, so you're basically describing your population. This is what we would call the hypothesis generating phase. So you're trying to figure out, well, who should I reach out to and what, what, what do I want to predict that they may do? So you can figure out, okay, from the analytic side, which kind of study design should I choose? And you have three primary types. It's usually cross-sectional, case control, cohort. This is more of a prevalence 
This is a retrospective and prospective. So this is like a single point in time. This is retroactively looking back. And this is from today moving forward. This is probably the most time intensive and costly to do, but it's really helpful. So think of it as from a digital perspective, if the descriptive is your target audience, right? So you're just trying to describe who are you trying to outreach to? So you start looking at your, your client's customer profiles, things like that. You start building different segments of audiences that you want to cater to. Then you, from the analytics side, you can look at the data in three different ways. You can either do a cross-sectional where you just look at it at a single point in time and you see, okay, what was the conversion rate right then and there? Or you can do more of like a case control setting where your campaign is done and you separate people into the converters and non-converters and you go back and you see exactly where were they exposed to your campaign? What was that attribution model? That, what did it look like? And then you have the cohort where literally your campaign starts and you keep following them throughout it because you don't have converters and non-converters at the start of the campaign. You know they're exposed or non-exposed, so you follow them throughout it. And it just kind of depends on really like the staff you have available and the time that you're able to invest in it, depending on which method you may choose. The other type of study design is experimental. And this is where you have things like your clinical trials, um, your community-based trials, and your quasi-experimental, which these are basically non-randomized. So this is where you could test things like interventions, promotions, things like that. So from a digital standpoint, this would be like doing random A-B testing of your landing pages, be like your clinical trial. From a community standpoint, you change specific features of the entire digital campaign so it affects the larger community base. And then your quasi-experimental, since it's non-randomized and you're trying to test interventions, more like focus groups. So you bring specific focus groups in and you test, okay, which creative do they like? Which, which figures do they understand? Which actually wants them to, causes them to want to take that call to action? So another decision-making process that you can use to actually help you figure out what kind you should use is there's this statistical, so many big words, <laughs> statistical decision-making process. In epidemiology, you have your question of interest, sample and population, then you kind of choose your study design, you do data collection in the description, and this is kind of a constant loop because if you find that your data that you're collecting isn't how you would like it to be, this is where you have to go back and you know, figure out, should I collect a different sample? Because it may not actually have the outcome you want. Then you formulate your hypothesis. You do inferential statistics, so this would be like um, two means comparisons, uh, logistic regression, linear regression. You interpret your results, and then you can implement initiatives or do additional studies. Digitally, very similar, instead of it being your question of interest, it's your business objective or goal. Your target audience is your sample, and then you develop a marketing plan. From there, you do the data collection and description of the data. In this case, say that you have conversions on a site, and you go and you look, and you see during the first week you have no conversions. Instead of assuming that nobody's converting, you should go back and look at the configuration of your collection of that conversion, and make sure that it's set up appropriately. Then you develop kind of a question of interest. What are your theories? Are visitors more likely to convert when they do X? Is it when they land on specific landing pages? Is it when they're served certain social ads? And then you actually test your theory using statistical models, using the exact same statistical models epidemiologists use. The great thing about stats is it's not prejudice against the data you're putting in or the type. It's all data to the, to the models. And then you report your internal findings to your teams and your clients. And this is where you just you modify your strategy based on the results. And it's just a constant loop. So then let's talk about some just more high level statistics. We're not going to get too deep today. Don't worry. I won't do that to you. <laughs> yes. So incidents and prevalence. Incidents is considered more like your new cases of people exhibiting a disease. Prevalence is existing and new, and say the bathtub's your community. So if you're looking at an incident rate, so how often is the disease occurring each month in new people? That's where you use the incidence, but then your denominator is the total population. If you're trying to figure out the prevalence or how much it is exhibited in the overall population, you use this as your numerator, total population as your denominator. You can have outside factors such as, not necessarily always vaccines, but you can have different treatments that increase 
the amount of cases you have, but then it prevents death. So it prevents something bad from happening, but they still have the disease, unfortunately. <laughs> and eventually, everybody comes out the drain. And either they're cured or they die. It's just kind of what happens with the disease process. But if we look at it from the digital perspective, literally, if you take the terms using the definitions of incidence and prevalence and just apply them digitally, it makes sense. Because you have your new client, you have your new customers, and then your existing customers. This is your digital landscape. That's where they're all bucketing it into. You can prevent drop-offs from happening by catering your digital campaign to them. So sending them targeted emails, ads, things like that. It increases the amount of existing people you retain. At the end of your campaign, you can then look and see, did I retain them or did I lose them? So let's talk about mortality. <laughs> so in epidemiology, mortality rate is something we look at quite often, right? So you take number of deaths. I know it's a sad thing and I actually have to pull up my number. I don't know why I did this to myself. I chose a bad number. You divide it by the total population and you multiply it by, say, 1,000. You can choose any number you want necessarily. It's like this is meaning you're trying to say there's this many deaths per 1,000 people. That equals your mortality rate. So for instance, again, don't know why I did this. Say you have a population size of 987,078. <laughs> yeah, I know. Number of deaths are 856. Well, your mortality rate then, if it's per 1,000, is 0.867, right? People like whole numbers in this case. So you could just adjust it and you could say it's actually 8.67 per 10,000 people. Now in digital, what do we look at? We look at conversions, right? Conversion rate, you take people who took the action you wanted, divided by all the people who came to your website, multiplied by 100 to get a rate, conversion rate. So if you compare these to one another, they're pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is, is when you're looking at mortality rates, you, you quantify it as per groups of visitors. So you could do the same thing with your conversion rate to clients. You could say, for every 1,000 visitors you get, you have five conversions. So it's kind of a way to help set targets that you need as well, just a different way of analyzing it. Some other stats that we look at are years of potential life lost. I know it's kind of depressing, sorry. You look at the average life expectancy of an individual, and then you subtract it by the age of death. So say the average life expectancy is 85. The age of death is 50 that person lost 35 years of potential life. And so really a lot of times epidemiologists would use this to assess like how much is affecting the population, generally the younger, because if you find that a disease is causing a lot of years life lost, that's a problem, especially if it's highly infectious and spreads, because then there's no people. That's pro yeah, that's problematic. So how do you translate this on a customer side? Now, this may have a term somewhat existing out there. Again, my background is not marketing. I couldn't really find one that defined it in the exact way that I was trying to. So I just defined it as years of customer life lost, of lifetime loss. So you take your average customer lifespan, and you just subtract it by the number of years a customer at time of loss. So say your average customer lifespan is 10, 10 years, and you lose a person at five. You lost five potential customer years. And if you know each one, of those, each one of those years a person's a customer, they generate $100 in revenue. You lost $500 worth of customer revenue, and it's a missed opportunity. So you can start quantifying that a little bit easier. It's not as complicated as looking at the lifetime value of a customer. It's a, it's a little bit shorter snapshot, easier to calculate. Some other things you can do, I'm not going to get into this too much, <laughs> but this is the measure of assessment of risk. So there's just a lot of different things you can simply do by putting your data in a two by two table. This is what we call two by two. So this is your two by two section here. You look at, okay, here's your disease. Is it present? Is it absent? And then were they exposed to a risk factor? Smoking, non-smoking, lung cancer, no cancer. You could get a ton of information just by graphing and looking at these different denominators and numerators. You could tell, What's the odds of an individual getting cancer if they smoked? Say it's five times more likely versus somebody who didn't smoke. You can start actually calculating those type of things. You can also do what's called a relative risk measure. 
and you typically only do that with like co cohort studies. That's where you start at the campaign and you follow them throughout, right? So what you would do is you would say, you know, people that were exposed are, you know, say, two, have a, high, a relative risk of two versus those who weren't exposed. And you want your relative risk to actually have more of a positive for your exposure variable. And there's different ways you can measure it. I won't get too much into the weeds. But for conversions, you essentially just replace disease with conversions, and there you go. You can use all the exact same measures of association in the same way, and it works. You just replace odds of disease with odds of conversion, and you can really start examining your data in a simple fashion without having to plug it into very complex models. So you want to do all of this. You have all this data or data that you want to collect. So what's next? Well. Like most people, everybody wants their data right now. Have witnessed this, been doing this for a long time, about 10 years, and seen the progression of how data has taken before everyone was like, you have the most boring job in the world, to apparently it's the most appealing. So I don't understand it, doesn't make any sense to me. I just like my computer. <laughs> what can I say? I do have a spouse at least, so I am partly human. <laughs> Just partly, as he says. Well, another problem you run into with data is that it is literally everywhere. There's so much data all over the place, you have to figure out what do you actually need to collect? Because if you spend time trying to get every single piece, you, you're never going to be able to finish anything. So you have to focus and select. That's where all of those processes and strategic thinking and mapping things out comes into play. It's a time investment. To do data the right way, it's an investment of time, especially in the beginning, but in the end it pays off, especially if you do it the right way. Because at the end, if you spend one month and then your results are poor and you have to just keep repeating the cycle versus if you would have invested that first month to set everything up and you continue using those models for the next three years, that's a month of time well invested. Some other things that you got to think about when you start collecting that data is data security. Yes, it's the alien. It's aliens, right? That's where all the data comes from. So data security is a big thing you need to worry about because when you start collecting that data, especially if there's identifying factors, you don't want to be hacked and then you're possibly liable. So you have to consider this as you start collecting it. Another thing that a lot of people are talking about is third party data. So for instance, if you're running a travel campaign, right? And a few summers ago, I don't know if you guys remember it, 35 was shut down for a time because we had all that rain in the summer between Texas and Oklahoma. There's so many different, you know, there's casinos, there's all these billboards for all these different places that you want to go and see, but nobody could really get to it. So if you're an advertising agency running campaigns for any of those companies, you know, it may look like, wow, we have poor conversions happening. However, if you take this third party data of say weather, right, or traffic patterns and overlay that with your digital data, you can show the client, it's like, look, our campaign just didn't perform well because there were outlying factors that affected it. So it can help you retain your customers if you plot it with it. So it's just an easy way of collecting data that's already out there. There's a lot of publicly accessible data sets. Like on, say you have a client that's based, like that's selling products that's based on the stock market. You can overlay stock market prices, things like that. Another thing is privacy. It's becoming a big deal. People don't want their privacy violated. It's getting harder to follow people. You can't stalk them like you used to. It's bad. Ugh, really stinks. <laughs> I used to be able to really find a lot. <laughs> but places like Facebook are getting smarter to this. People don't want you to be able to just search a term and then their posts show up just because they happen to mention that term. So Facebook got rid of that, I think, within the last year, year and a half was really difficult to handle that because at the time I was using that to figure out how many people were talking about our, a specific client. So we had to go and look for a third party tool and we ended up having to spend hundreds, hundreds of dollars a month on a social listener. But that's kind of what's happening in a lot of the digital spaces with these larger social media entities. Twitter has the fire hose access, kind of the same deal. They restricted it to a very select few group of companies, which is unfortunate for the smaller people because well now you have to pay to get that data. So it's becoming a little bit, it's be making things a little bit harder for us smaller guys. Another thing you have to worry about, spurious correlations, okay? 
you know, I, I don't know if a lot of you guys have heard about this. They say cancer incidence is on the rise with cell phone uses. Well, really, cell phones have become readily available and accessible to the majority of the population over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. There's other outlying factors that cause cancer, environment, diet, we're, you know, pollute, all kinds of things that are affecting us. So just because you tend to plot two points of data next to one another and they seem to have an association doesn't mean that it's actual cause, actually causal. I have to tell my mom all the time, please don't believe everything you hear on the news every day. Because especially when it's study-based, I'm like, okay, what sample did they use? How did they collect it? I basically am able to help her understand. It's like, I under, understand, oh, eating dark chocolate every single day is great, but it's a small amount. So in moderation, same thing with wine. Sorry, folks. <laughs> moderation is key. Another one that you'll run into with data, I've ran into this a lot over the years, is that the data may not tell people what they want to hear, right? So somebody may have spent, I ran into this a lot of a previous place, they spend a lot of time <laughs> creating a piece of content, right? Say it's a, a video, and they spent 20, 30 hours of time developing this video, and they wanted a lot of people to see it and view it and watch it to completion. However, you look at the data, it's like hardly anybody watched that video. Instead of listening to the data and realizing maybe they needed to adjust how they were marketing it, make it shorter, maybe not make it 10 minutes, maybe make it three or even less, promote it on social media, do clips, things like that. You know, you, you run into this a lot. People may just not like what the data says. At the same time, you have to take into account industry knowledge. For instance, if you're looking just at data and it's for a clothing store and all of a sudden you see a spike of winter clothing that's being bought in the summertime. Well, we live in Oklahoma, which everybody knows the weather changes within a day. It can go from being 80 degrees in the morning to 50 by the time you get it out of work. And it can change drastically. So just because it seems like, oh, next summer we need to increase the number of winter apparel we're stocking, it just, it just could be there was just some sort of spontaneous event that happened and caused that correlation to be there. So you have to be careful and include the industry knowledge at the same time with the data. You can't really just take the data at its root because you have to consider all the other context behind it. A lot of times analysts that are, you know, tend to stay in their box, to be completely honest, have a hard time looking outside of that realm. The reason why I think for, for me is, in, since my background was epidemiology, they teach you to study and collect the data, but then also how to analyze it. So you, I literally got to see the entire process. So I understood when I looked at the data, I really needed to understand how it was collected, who they were, so that I could actually give them, like my researchers, a better understanding of what their data was telling them. So who do you need? This is a big question. Well, Yoda says it best. You need data scientists, right? It's a big term. It's, been it's actually been around for a while. It's just becoming popular again, being an analyst, data person, it's incredibly appealing these days. And it's all, I mean, you hear it all the time, right? But there's several different types of data scientists. It's not just one type of person. You have people that can know how to manipulate and mine the data, but then you have people that know how to actually visualize it. Then you have people that know how to store it. These are different types of people with different backgrounds, but they're all data scientists in their own respective ways. So, welcome to the dark side of data science. It's a bit more complex. Here's a great figure. This is typically what encompasses data science, right? You have computer science, math statistics, subject matter expertise, research, software, machine learning. Finding an individual that exhibits all of these qualities and knows how to do them extremely well and can be independently self-sufficient does not exist. It is literally a mythological creature, which is why a lot of times if you read articles or you see them, they talk about data scientists like they are unicorns. But they're really not. It's just that instead of being individuals, they're teams. In this case, you know, um, as Sarah said earlier, my spouse and I work together. Um, we've been working together now almost two years, two years. Never would have thought we would have ever been able to relate to one and each other, each other job-wise. He has a background in marketing, he's worked retail, he's managed parking garages, all kinds of things. Vast background. Me, I come from healthcare research. 
never thought that those two would have ever worked or meshed well together. When I got the opportunity to actually come to an advertising agency, I started talking to him a little bit more and he said, well, that's this in marketing. It's like, oh, so this, but this is, an, this is what I use when I study disease. And he's like, yeah, these are the same thing. So literally the exact same methods, strategies I use to study disease, I realized, wow, I just use this in marketing. And it was such an easy transition to make, it was amazing. Like I was so, I was honestly pretty freaked out about it because it's like, it's a huge change, right? You go from healthcare research to marketing. Usually science people don't ever want to hear about marketing. They don't want to talk to marketers. They're like, just, give, just, just go away. They don't want to do it. Those two fields never really touch, but they have so much parity that you know, sometimes when you're trying to find the analytic talent, you may have to look in places you never thought to. So perhaps you have somebody come by your desk that submitted a resume that literally their entire background is healthcare research. Don't just completely set them aside and not consider them because they may actually be able to translate over to marketing, but you have to be able to gauge how curious they are. That's the big thing that a lot of people that do data well have is that curiosity factor. It's something that somebody has to have, you just can't, they can't grow to be there. People are inherently born curious or not curious, I've discovered in my years. It really is, it's amazing. And there's different ways you can kind of gauge that in your questions that you ask people in an interview. You could just, you can tell them, it's like, yeah, I was researching something the other day and I kind of found this, but I, I couldn't figure out what was happening and see if they engage with you, see if they actually try and talk with you about it. They're like, oh, that's neat. You can kind of tell, it's like, for me, if somebody says something like that to me in a regular conversation, in interviews, immediately, I'm like, well, what were you, what, what were you looking at? How were you collecting it? What, what did you do exactly? Like, I kind of go on a tangent a little bit, but that helps my employer know, or potential employer, that, wow, they're gonna dig deep and they're gonna be self-sufficient, look, and research. And, so basically, look in places that you wouldn't traditionally try and find talent. End of the talk. Big data, it's everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We still have time for questions. Anybody have questions for Jessica? You, you, you're not? Um, whenever your Google Analytics and you're looking at where your traffic came from, mm -hmm. For spam, well, like what interesting. So it kind of depends actually on a couple of factors and it could simply be that your UA account, right? If, you, if your UA account ends in dash one, Google uh, bots, a lot of people can send traffic to your website using the measurement protocol. So it's people not ever hitting your site. So a lot of companies you'll see um, like the SEO type uh, spam coming through. And it's just people trying to just navigate and hit your site but they're using a random number generator. So if it's a dash one account, you're more likely to get hit than say if you use a dash two. So that can happen. Um, the ratio, it just kind of depends on also if your site, I've noticed that the more optimized the site is for SEO, the more often it can get hit by spam. Because at a previous position I was at, you know, the sites weren't really optimized for SEO, so we hardly would ever see spam traffic. However, sites that I noticed were optimized for SEO were getting a lot more spam. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. The ratio just kind of depends on the population, your target audience, and the best way to kind of handle it is, you know, a lot of places say create filters or segments. It just kind of depends on what's easiest for you and how often they're coming up. And there's not really a, a good or bad ratio, unfortunately. I know that's a really big answer, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. What if you have a smaller business or website? Mm -hmm and you don't have the resources to have one or one designated person or a team of people to just do this. Um, how can you do this on a smaller scale to at least try and apply the principles that you're talking about? A lot of things you can do is honestly go outside of the analytics interface. In all honesty, the analytics interface is great for like single touch points, <coughs> but if you really want to go deeper, you're so limited on how many dimensions and metrics you can look at at a time, even in your custom reports. You know, you're limited to, I think, five dimensions and seven metrics. Whereas if you went to like the API level, you could actually get uh, seven dimensions, 10 metrics. And so there's different tools that you can buy. They're not very expensive. 
that actually go ahead and connect to the APIs for you so you don't have to worry about having development staff that can write Python or you know, PHP for you to, correct, you know, to create those connectors and start pulling down your data on a more regular basis and using things like Excel to kind of look at things historically. And that's one way, um, kind of what, how I describe it as, because that when at my previous position, you know, I was a team of one for a while. Um, Terry came on when, because we both worked together at a previous company. I know we followed each other around. Um, you know, I used Excel a lot and I used connectors to APIs and I became resourceful. And so there's just so many things out there. They're not real, well known though. That's part of the problem is that you kind of have to dig for it. But that's kind of a way to get around it is go outside the interface, find kind of uh, an Excel based add-in or desktop standalone app that allows you to actually pull from the APIs and just start collecting it that way instead of having to do interface based. Hey on guys, I know there's still some questions out there. It's okay, I know it was a lot. <laughs> well, feel free to mingle yeah. after this and ask well, us any other questions you might have too. And also, so it'll be in 2017, don't know exactly when. It's gonna kind of be a phase two approach and it will actually get a little bit more into actually collecting it, how you analyze the data, navigating that path. So data detectives in the digital space, finding the signals within the noise. So that will be coming next year. Um, look out for it. And uh, I'll send, I can send an email out later. I'm going to put this talk actually on a blog that I use. And so it's called mavendata.com. I know I'm a geek. I say. But I can put this on there. So if you guys want to look at it and see the figures and things like that, it'll be available for you. Thank you.